Well, thank you to uh, Linda, to the uh, Mental Health Association of Maryland, and congratulations on your centennial. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, also, thank you very much to Henry Harbin and the Kennedy Forum for all the great work that they've done in advancing our agenda. I also want to thank Dr. Heinsen because, uh, my, as Linda mentioned, my main job is running uh, long-term residential programs for young adults with mental illness. Uh, we have a program in Frederick. Uh, we're about to open a program in Minnesota in collaboration with Mayo. Uh, and we're working on developing another program in Los Angeles that's geared towards veterans. Uh, the RAISE study is incredibly important to us. It uh, really shows that if you treat young people intensively, comprehensively, you can make a big difference in their lives. Um, and hopefully we can use that as a policy decision to influence public and private payers to invest in this kind of treatment. Today, I'm, today though, I'm going to talk about a different project. Dr. Heinsen also alluded to this, which is the use of technology to uh, individualize treatment, to empower people to do more treatment on their own, and to sustain the improvements that they might gain uh, either in a residential program or other types of treatment. So CyberGuide is a project of IMRO, International Mental Health Research Organization, which is Garen Staglin's group based in San Francisco. Um, let's see. Oops. So CyberGuide is a nonprofit. It's a 501c3. It's housed in IMRO, established two years ago by the Bowman Family Foundation and the Herman Foundation, for whom I work. Uh, and, and we intend to be an unbiased consumer guide to rate software and apps for mental health conditions. And right now we're focused on schizophrenia, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders, including PTSD. Um, we're currently uh, writing grant applications, going to foundations, raising money, and looking for partners Hopefully the Mental Health Association would like to be a partner. Uh, we would like to get this to the point where it's a, a large effort, really examining the whole field comprehensively and getting good data on these apps, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I think you know, we've probably heard from several different people at this conference about why the promise of technology looks so bright. And I've just summarized some of them here. You know, there are many areas of our country where there are no mental health professionals. 55% of counties in the United States do not have a single psychiatrist, social worker, or psychologist. So access to care is a major issue in the United States. Um, you know, and people that live in those communities are tasked, you know, with uh, getting in the car, driving to the capital city, sitting around in a clinic, getting 15 minutes with the doctor, and then go back home. And as all of you know, these are very chronic, persistent illnesses in many cases that the patient and family have to wake up and deal with every day. So how do we capture real-time data about the daily struggle of the patient and help them overcome it? Even in areas where there are services, they tend to be very poorly coordinated. So you have short-term hospitalization, you have private practitioners, you have PHPs. Usually they're all owned by different entities. They don't talk to each other. And the patients feel like they're jostled around amongst the different components of the healthcare system. And can, can technology be something that connects the patients with all the different levels on a real-time basis to help them maintain stability, stay out of the hospital, and uh, stay at work? We think these technologies empower people who want to take a more active role in their treatment. They also have the capacity to acquire large amounts of data over time. So as a psychiatrist, usually I would see a patient, it's a cross-sectional view for a few minutes about the last month of their life. But with these technologies, you can bring a summary of everything that's happened to them for the past month, their sleep, their exercise, uh, and their compliance with medication, their psychotherapy. So it has the potential to bring a lot more information into the system and also re reduction of stigma with a more self-directed approach to care. So there's at least 3,000, maybe more apps on the marketplace right now that say 
they will do something for mental health. Uh, and these are developed all the way from smart kids in their garages making an app to big companies that actually put a lot of time and effort into designing the product. But most of these applications are not tested in controlled trials the way we do for medications. There is no formal regulatory pathway for these apps, so there's no government agency or other agency saying these are safe, these are effective, and they're worth the money. So how do consumers, families, and patients know which one they should pick? Patients would come to me all the time and say, which of these things should I get? And I would say, I don't know. We don't have any good data. There are no studies. Uh, and we'll just have to take a stab at it. So the idea behind CyberGuide is we would try to collect qualitative data and build kind of a consumer reports information source free of commercial bias that would help people make these decisions. So this is a study that illustrates the need for this. This was from out of Australia. They found 571 apps that said they worked on psychoeducation for bipolar disorder. 82 met criteria for review. Only 22% had a stated privacy policy. Only 36% that claimed they performed psychoeducation adhered to the core principles of that discipline. Only 15% followed best practice guidelines the way we think of them. <clears throat> Only 31% cited references, information source as to where they got uh, their content. And the user's perception of the apps had no correlation whatsoever with the comprehensiveness of their ability to follow the psychoeducation techniques or guidelines. So it's a little bit the Wild West out there. And to figure out what products are of good quality and not harmful and worth the money is what we're trying to do. How should apps be rated? We're really at the beginning of this story. It's brand new. Um, and so earlier this year, the Australian group, Australia, by the way, has been very far ahead on this because of the remoteness of the population there. Uh, and the government has invested a lot of money in trying to figure out how to reach people in outlying areas. So they, a lot, most publications in this world seem to come out of Australia. But they developed the mobile app rating scale. It was published earlier this year. It looks mostly at user uh, characteristics um, and the, the interface, and so the engagement, functionality, aesthetics, information. They've actually published data on internal consistency, consistency and iterator reliability. But that scale is heavily rated towards uh, the quality of the user experience, the way the, la the app looks and feels, and whether people like it. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America has taken this on. They have a scale that looks also at qualitative, um, I don't know if this pointer works, uh, no. Um, and they have volunteer uh, reviewers. Their site really only lists 11 apps at this point because they've looked at them fairly carefully. And they have not published anything about how they do their scale, how they rate, rate these things, and how um, reliable it is between different raters. The National Health Service in England, this is a very interesting story, had an app rating site. And the National Health Service, because it's a uh, single payer system, really looked at these things carefully with good research, good evidence base. And they only listed on their sites things that were recommended for use by consumers and patients which led to the National Health Service agreeing to pay for these things and reimburse them. They only had a few apps, but unfortunately, they just recently had to take down their whole site because they found out they had not looked at privacy issues, and many of these apps did not encrypt personal data. They were selling personal data to other uh, companies and without consent of patients. So the whole privacy issue about what happens to your data when you sign up with one of these app services is an ongoing question. So we're trying to answer many of these questions at CyberGuide. We have uh, products listed by disease category, schizophrenia, mood disorders, anxiety. 
We also have the products broken down by methodology, cognitive training exercises, cognitive remediation, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness products, um, and symptom and adherence trackers. The site contains various types of information. We have a detailed product description. We do our own rating scale, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we put all scientific bi bibliography relevant to the products on the site. We hire academic experts to write detailed reviews of the products and give a lot of information about what's behind the scenes. And we recently established a consumer rating portal because what we, we want to be sort of like a mini patients like me and we want to have people who actually use the products go on there, say what they think about them, and rate them. And that's been actually one of our biggest challenges, is getting people to go to the site and record their data. But we think that's a, a, a potential huge source of information in the absence of controlled clinical trials. I won't go through this point by point, but this is our rating scale. Our rating scale is heavily geared towards the evidence base. You get more points for randomized controlled trials. You get more points if your app has been vetted by uh, more than one agency. If you get government or nonprofit funding, ostensibly that's vetted more carefully than purely investment money. And you get a zero if you just funded it yourself. Uh, so the more people you have to convince to take a risk, the higher uh, score you get. You get more points if you have uh, thought leader support. You get more points if you make a, spec a specificity claim to do a particular thing for a particular illness. Uh, we also find out how many consumer ratings exist on other sites like the Apple Store, the Google, um, and we count them up. You get points for that. And we also give points for people who seem to be very interested in updating and modifying their software on a regular basis based on consumer input. So right now, I think this has changed a little bit. We probably have over 70 products that we selected uh, to rate. Uh, you can see the, the, the graph on the left. There are fewer available for schizophrenia than there are for mood and anxiety disorders. Most of the schizophrenia products are in the cognitive remediation world. Um, and the scores on our scale range from a low of 14% to a high of 86%. On average, it comes out to be about 50%. Uh, and you can see them by disease on the right. The schizophrenia products tend to have higher ratings because these things tend to have been studied, publications about them. And there are a lot of mood and anxiety apps that have no evidence base whatsoever. Um, the last two statements have also changed. We've got hired expert reviews probably for about a third of the products. Still, we have very few consumer ratings, maybe only 5 or 8% of the products have people actually gone on and started uh, saying what they think. Um, one big question, this is sort of a, a little bit of a digression, you know, uh, there's a lot of question about will people use the apps if you make them? Will patients with psychiatric illness be any better at complying with these things than they are with medications or, or therapy visits? Um, and we're at the beginning stage of figuring that out. On the left, there's a meta-analysis of 15 studies looking at 3,000 patients with psychosis. About two-thirds of them actually own smartphones, and about 50% of them say they would use their smartphone to communicate with their providers or their healthcare system. On the right is a NAMI study looking at fewer patients, about 500. About 90% have access to computers. About half have access to smartphones. They spend four or five hours a day online. Some of their activities are geared towards illness, uh, modification, and education. I think that's helpful, 43 to 58% of the time. 18% of them think that online activity is harmful. They get distracted and go on to stuff that's you know, not helping them. So I only have a few minutes left, but I want to show you some examples just for illustration. This is cognitive behavioral therapy. On the left is an Australian program called Mood Gym. This is sort of first generation. It was developed in 2004. It's software-based. It gets a relatively high rating on our CyberGuide scale because there's a lot of publications, controlled trials about this. 
it gets a relatively low rating on the Mars scale because it's clunky, it's text-based, and it's, you can't use it on your mobile phone. It doesn't feel fun, it doesn't feel friendly, it doesn't feel engaging, but it's very sound scientifically. On the right, Moodkit is a app phone app launched in 2011. It gets a relatively low score on our scale because there are no publications about it, but it gets a high score on the Mars uh, scale because people love to use it. It's very easy to negotiate, very intuitive. Cognitive remediation, likewise, Scientific Brain Training Pro is developed by a French company. It's on the left. Uh, it gets a very high rating on our scale. Um, lots of publications, lots of evidence, but it's software-based and requires interaction with a therapist to use. Uh, so it gets lower ratings than Lumosity, which everyone's heard of on the right. Lumosity gets a relatively lower rating on our scale, but this is by far and away preferred by patients. They can use it on their smartphones and it's fun. It's still not determined whether it's efficacious uh, in terms of improving cognition over time. Two examples of symptom trackers on the left is a PTSD symptom tracker, which basically the patient records their daily experience with mood, anxiety, medication compliance. And on the right is one for schizophrenia called ClinTouch. Uh, both of these get sort of intermediate level ratings. Uh, and now I, I want to spend a few minutes on new directions. And the first new direction is wearable. And you've already heard today about Muse, uh, which is manufactured by Interaxon. Um, where you wear this headband that sends your EEG power spectrum to your smartphone and based on the principles of neurofeedback can help you learn to regulate that EEG rhythm and ostensibly help with stress and anxiety. Um, it gets a relatively low rating on our scale because they haven't published a lot. It gets a very high rating on the Mars scale because again it's intuitive, friendly, and attractive. This is actually my record on the right. Uh, it gives you very nice feedback on what you're doing. I'm one of those people who's tried to meditate my whole life and I've never been very good at it, but I'm actually getting better using this. The, the blue bars at the top, they're supposed to be all the way up to the top at 100% calm. I usually get about 30 or 40 or 50%, but I am getting better. And the feedback that you get really can help you learn to do this and call it up at will when you're in a stressful situation. So I really like this technology. Um, some other new directions, ingestible and passive data collection. In September, the FDA accepted a new drug application from a company named Proteus, which has figured out how to put a chip inside of a pill that communicates with a patch and then with your smartphone to collect data on how often patients take their medications. On the right is a program called Mobilize, which combines user-entered data, you rate your own mood and medication compliance, along with a large volume of passive data collection. It uses GPS, ambient light, and recent phone calls to figure out how active you are and how you may be feeling, and uses a machine learning approach to track mood, emotion, and activity over long periods of time. Of course, these things that are collecting data that you're not aware of raise a lot of privacy concerns, but the field is moving in this direction. I think I'll skip that one. Another new direction is electronic case management. These are large suites of apps that uh, connect the patient to the various uh, levels of care to make it more coordinated. WellFrame is in the Boston market used by a number of different um, community mental health centers. Mindula on the right is making entree into the DC market, uh, both very attractive and theoretically very cost saving uh, and helpful to patients. So I'm gonna conclude Cyber Guide. These are the people, my helpers are Jason Moringer, a psychologist, Victoria Pickering works on the web, Brandon Staglin at, at IMRO works with us. Our scientific board is very illustrious. We've got really great people from several prominent institutions listed here but we're always looking for more experts, more people who want to write reviews, and more people who want, would like to partner with us to make this a bigger and more comprehensive effort. 
Thank you very much.